in the years of um, carp of supremacy uh, in the world, there are many uh, strategic methods that uh, were tightly connected with uh, with his name, and uh, some of his uh, fellow grandmasters, fellow world champions, apparently did not feel uh, quite all right with this uh, attitude. I remember having having read a, a commentary by Bodvinik on one of his own games, played in the 50s maybe or 60s, in which uh, he completely dominated the position with with Black. And what um, uh, stated something like, uh, well, um, this is a, a clear proof that the method of domination was not invented by Anatoly Evgenievich Karpov. Of course, it was a lot of irony in, uh, in this comment. And, uh, uh, but one thing is clear, uh, of course, Karpov did, did play some great chess, but... Uh, uh, of course, he had also learned certain things from uh, from the previous um, uh, world champions and great players. And um, I have already uh, mentioned uh, some pre-Karpovian elements in uh, in uh, Fischer's game uh, against Philip. And um, now I'd like to to show another game, uh, once again from the Parma de Mallorca Interzonal, uh, in which uh, Fischer did constantly what Karpov used to do very well too, uh, meaning re restricting Black's counterplay, maintaining the space advantage and uh, uh, completely avoiding Black's counterplay. In fact, I have seen this in, um, in the game against Pasky, but uh, the structure and the, the variation played there, let's say, were not really typical for Karpov. But now uh, we'll see a game in which Fischer... Uh, used uh, a variation that also beca beca later became a, a trademark of uh, Karpov. So, um, he played Taimanov. He played against Taimanov, who used uh, this uh, Paul, so-called Paulson Taimanov variation, which bears his name, knight b5, d6. Now in the match that, uh, in which he crashed Tamanov uh, just one year later, Fischer uh, usually played bishop f4, e5, bishop e3. This is actually uh, a Sveshnikov with the um, next tempo for black, but by that, those times uh, the Sveshnikov con was, con was not even named like this. It was named uh, Pelican and it was considered uh, a dubious uh, opening. But in this game... In Palma de Mallorca, Fischer, maybe he didn't want to reveal his uh, circuit analysis, and he played c4, which is very much uh, uh, what Karpov uh, used to do. Knight f6, bishop e2. Okay, the move order is slightly unusual. Usually the knights uh, get these squares uh, in other move order. But, uh, okay, it's... It's uh, transposing. Okay, so this is a normal tabia. Uh, the bishop b7 is the normal move here. But uh, Taimanov uh, was also an original player and he played bishop d7, not really analyzed in theory too much. The plan is to prepare b5. Because with the knight on, knights on a3 and c3, it seems hard to, to, to prepare this freeing move. But at the same time, with the bishop on d5, uh, black has such a plan. Queen b8, rook a7. Rook a7, rook b7, and finally uh, b5, okay, and knight e5, of course, on the way. And uh, then the bishop uh, would be very, very useful on uh, on d7. Um, f, rook c1, uh, queen b8. Okay, these, all these are uh, normal moves. And now, <clears throat> now first, the first interesting moment uh, we have here, uh, usually, black oh, white keeps his knight on a3 for a long time in this variation. The knight, well, Taras had his ideas about the knight uh, on the edge of the board. Uh, so, but still, the knight is useful because it defends c4, it controls b5. So, uh, usually in this line, white would play something like queen here, uh, then uh, queen f2. Rook f d1, and eventually, at some point, he would recycle the knight. Maybe, maybe to b1, maybe to b1 or to c2, uh, but only later. 
Um, but this is uh, usually the case with uh, with the pawn uh, with the bishop on b7. With the bishop on d7, it may be not such a good idea because after rook b8 and knight e5, white would have the the surprise that uh, he would not be in time to to stop b5. So Fischer obviously did not want to allow time out of such uh, such an easy life. He played knight c2 uh, before having completed his uh, his development. Uh, his main idea being that. Um, Okay, uh, after a few more uh, preparatory moves from both uh, sides. Um, his main idea was that he can stop a5, uh, b5 physically with a4. It is also true that uh, a4 is um, a double-edged move. It prevents the counterplay, but at the same time it puts another uh, pawn on a light square. And it allows black to to play for a blockade on dark squares. Um, many years later, uh, Taimanov published a, a small book, which uh, uh, is titled something like uh, "I Was uh, uh, Fisher's Victim," and uh, he mainly analyzes the the match in which he was destroyed with uh, six to zero, but he also analyzes this game, and uh, his comments are. are not bad, are quite instructive, but uh, I cannot help think, thinking uh, what Bodvinik uh, once wrote about Taimanov. He said that Taimanov is very talented, he understands chess very well, but he has one major drawback, keeping him away from becoming an even stronger player. He does not have doubts, he does not like to have doubts on the way of uh, searching the truth. So if he would uh, see something glittering, he would immediately think that it's gold. So um, this uh, makes that Taimanov was kind of uh, original and uh, optimistic player, but uh, not not all his comments and uh, evaluations are um, are accurate. For instance, he already considers that Black has a great position, which is not really the truth. After all, he's still uh, he's still defending on on three rows, with the exception of the a5 pawn. And then we have this uh, weakness on before, but. Uh, there is also this weakness on on b5. It's not very obvious, obvious how um, how white can get there, but we'll see that Fischer eventually got there. So it means that Fischer's strategical vis vision was uh, quite uh, long sighted. Uh, sighted. Uh, it, it, uh, he knew that there was a chance that at some point uh, a rook got there. Okay, I, I will give you a hint. It's not very ob obvious by now, but uh, a white rook got on b5 with decisive effect uh, already. Um, for the time being, uh, okay, he exchanged this knight, who, which has lost a lot of time already. Um, and now um, the first critical moment arrives. Obviously, Black wants to to play knight c5 at some point to to block the the queen's hand and even start putting some pressure on the b3 and a4 uh, pawns. Queen g3 is a normal move. Um, it more or less forces bishop f6, but bishop f6 made part of uh, black's plan anyway, because uh, uh, he wants to exchange the dark square bishops. And uh, again, it seems that uh, white, uh, black has, has uh, achieved uh, many strategic goals. This blockade on dark squares uh, seems in, uh, to be in sight already. But there is a problem. He still has to cross the d7 square, the d-file, with his knight in order to get to c5 and to get um, an active position. And uh, this um, this means that white can try to, to prevent it with, by placing a rook on d1. Actually, there is um, some criticism I would uh, make here on Fischer's uh, last move. Um, Fischer, uh, like uh, like Smuslov, uh, even though he did not express it clearly, liked harmony in the position. And of course, I mean, I suppose he did not not doubt too much which rook really belongs to d1, because the c1 rook was developed already, and uh, then he thought, okay, rook's in the center. But the problem is, the 
the next part of the game will reveal that rook c d1 would be would be stronger because with the rook on uh, on f1 f4 would become much uh, much stronger let's just make the same moves as in the game without uh, explaining uh, anything and now we see that already there are some strong threats rook takes f6 is a threat followed by by knight d5 and if uh, if g5 then uh, then simply uh, queen takes uh, h4, this check. It is better to, to force the king to uh, occupy an unfavorable square. And now white has a, a pawn for the exchange and um, a decisive attack. The black king is very weak. Okay, Fischer play rook fd1, e5. Now it seems that knight is 7 is, cannot be avoided. And Queen h4, another strong move. Uh, the main thing is that uh, after knight uh, d5, uh, white can uh, can go like this. Queen d8, rook b8, queen g5. And uh, since queen d2 is not uh, not possible, black's counterplay and the compensation for the pawn is okay. It's real, but probably not not enough, not enough for uh, for equalizing. And um, Tamanov found a very interesting move, h6, he was uh, proud of it actually. Now in the same line, uh, uh, the queen could, cannot retreat to g5 anymore, which means that queen d2 would uh, offer uh, black a very strong initiative. But at the same time, I don't think that Tamanov can, uh, can rely on the fact that he tricked Fischer, because by provoking h6, Fischer also slightly tricked uh, Taimanov, because in the future the h6 pawn would be a target. Uh, so Fischer understood this uh, rather well, uh, while in his comments uh, Taimanov remains uh, very, very optimistic. Rook d2, knight d7, rook c d1, uh, so, sorry, uh, bishop d1. This is a typical uh, uh, regrouping to defend uh, a4 and b3, and also uh, also to to get some uh, some activity along uh, along this uh, diagonal because uh, white is planning uh, to to play uh, f4 bishop d1 knight c5 f4 well again we see that uh, rook on f1 would have been most uh, most useful but okay this uh... and now uh, the critical moment of the game uh, arrives at least from uh, from black's point of view um, Taimanov, Taimanov's comment is really, really uh, interesting. He said that uh, despite uh, White's uh, display of inventiveness, uh, Black has uh, the clear initiative. Well, I, I'm not sure that uh, Black has the initiative. I mean, Black, for the time being, Black is consolidating and uh, he has a stable position and some blockade, but where is the initiative? White is not attacking anything. Black has no initiative at all. It's precisely what Fischer has been playing for. And uh, was really... Fischer really so inventive. I mean, he just received Black's counterplay, and it was Black who invented some small uh, things like Bishop d7, h6. So I think that it's uh, the other way around. Um, White had some initiative, and uh, Black was inventive enough to, to more or less uh, neutralize it. The position is roughly equal, but still quite complicated. Uh, but now the, we see this, um, this target here. Uh, Taimanov suggests that uh, Rook 7 would have uh, offered the black an advantage. I'm not so sure if this is uh, really true. I mean, okay, he has to free his bishop uh, with f6 probably. Knight d5. Bishop f5. I mean, uh, first of all, white is uh, very solid. It's not uh, easy to make uh, progress with, with black, to suggest a pawn break or whatever. Secondly, if he takes on d5, then uh, then after e takes d5, uh, the c2 bishop becomes uh, very strong, especially with the pawn on h6. And secondly, white could also try uh, such such an attack with, uh, with some reasonable compensation for uh, for the pawn. Okay, black can most probably defend uh, rook d7, rook f3. There is, there are some dangers, but okay, 
uh, over the board is not easy to to understand whether this is a real attack or not. It's probably just some reasonable compensation for white, but not not more. In any case, uh, probably feeling that his uh, king side is uh, needs some defense. Taiman of plate knight e6, which is a major um, inaccuracy indeed, because uh, the knight belongs on uh, on a dark square. Um, so starting with this point, actually, uh, Fischer uh, gets the initiative more and more. King h1, um, bishop c6, rook c3. Finally, the rooks are activated in a very nice way. The problem is that uh, black cannot uh, cannot play this because uh, uh, he would lose the knight. So, uh, because the last move had just unpinned the, the rook. So, um, he went knight g5. But okay, already the knight is on a seemingly active square, but very far from the blocking squares. I mean, the set against e4 is not uh, something uh, so terrible. So, little by little, actually, uh, black is uh, driven away from uh, what is uh, his main uh, his main plan. And now, uh, okay, he decided to, to eliminate this knight, which was quite annoying. Rook takes d5, queen c7. Now we can understand uh, that uh, somehow, somehow, uh, one of the merits of uh, provoking a6, a5 uh, has been revealed. The rook has free access to b5, which is something Fischer might have foreseen somehow intuitively. I don't uh, claim that he. So this position, but he thought, probably thought that there would be one day a rook on, on b5. For the time being, he, he activates his bishop with, with e5 and uh, removes one more important defender of the c5 square. Uh, now the blockade uh, becomes a little bit problematic uh, with, um, with, with the knight so far away. It's also... Now, now black has to, to avoid some... Uh, some simple tricks such as uh, mate on the back rank. Uh, rook db8 was uh, was played. It aimed to be a consolidating move, but it's it's, it's actually it can be considered a decisive mistake already. The problem is that he should he should have brought a knight closer to to the c5 square, and uh, even though. Uh, White's position uh, looks promising after this sequence. Okay, for the moment the knight cannot get to, to c5, but black can hang on on this position somehow. He's in some danger, his king is weak, h5 in the air, the rook may come to g3. But okay, he still, uh, he still keeps some stability. Uh, after rook db8, uh, Bishop f5, quite a strong move. Now uh, the knight's access to to e6 is uh, is denied. So now uh, he can forget about uh, blockading ideas. G6 h4, a strong intermediate move. Now the knight gets even farther from the from the uh, thematic uh, strategic fight. Um, Uh, sorry, I uh, I made a mistake here. Um, here uh, he played first uh, no, in this position. Uh, he played. Um, he exchanged queens and then and then uh, did uh, the same. Okay. We had this insertion of uh, of moves. Okay, we see that the knight uh, jumps uh, jumps around quite a lot, but uh, the bishop is uh, very versatile in such situations. It keeps the knight under domination. The knight cannot uh, does not have many possibilities of, of ma maneuvering. Uh, now the bishop wins an important tempo by, by attacking the the enemy rook. Rook d7 and rook here, and suddenly it's. Um, it's quite unpleasant that uh, uh, the b6 pawn is attacked and pinned, and c5 is coming, and 
Well, the counterplay uh, which uh, was generated by uh, by this move does not lead to anything uh, good for uh, for black. Um, look before takes takes. And, uh, well, this is already an ending which is obviously very promising for black. Just look how the position, for white, sorry. Just look how pro how much the position has changed uh, over the past uh, moves. Black has no blockading plan on the on the coin side. And the A4 pawn, uh, A4 pawn which uh, apparently advanced uh, in, in not a very favorable form for white, is now a very dangerous candidate to promotion. And... Uh, Fisher uh, did a good end game job and uh, and he won uh, he won the game